pray for your power and your love and your wisdom to flow as I just step out of the way. Oh, yeah. You use me as a vessel yes, sir. to minister what you want to this congregation. Thank you, Lord. I thank you for the privilege. I'm overwhelmed by it. I'm humbled by it. And Lord, I just pray right now that we would be in the presence now of the living word of God, not the word of Tom, but the word of God for this hour. And I just step out of the way, and I pray, Lord, move by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may be seated. I'm going to have you turn to a well-known passage in the Bible. I was going to speak on something else. I was going to speak on something that had to do with you shall be holy for I am holy. It's uh, uh, about discipline in the church. You know, we need that. We need to understand what the Lord really expects of us when it comes to divorce and remarriage. You know, uh, praise God, but I just want to give honor to the Lord. And I want to give honor to uh, the Lord for leading me to this wonderful church. And for uh, I want to give honor to our pastor yes. and our co-pastor and our yes. leaders. Because... We have a hunger here for the Word of God, not only to know it, but to do it even when it comes to the practical things. And it oftentimes gives us great conviction. There's so much in the Bible about watching out for sexual immorality in all of its many different forms. 1 Corinthians 5 speaks of how to deal with sin in the church. It goes along with Matthew 18. So many churches are afraid to practice that, but we have to commit ourselves to making sure our hearts are right, and then in love and a spirit That's of gentleness, right. going with the, to those whom we know or suspect are in sin, and if we find out they are, we go to them, and we try to win them over. If we can't, we take uh, one or two others so that we, they can be persuaded, and if they aren't persuaded, we can take it before the church, because the church isn't supposed to receive any accusation unless there are two or three witnesses. Mm. And then if they don't listen to the church, Hand them over to the devil. That means put them outside. All right. The devil is out there. Put them out of the church. Why? Because we are angry with them? We want to get back at them? No. No, no. For the destruction of their flesh, that their spirit might be saved in the day of Christ Jesus. That they might be handed over to something, that they might get so sick of it. Like the prodigal son, they'll run right back. All right. And uh, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 says, deal with this man who has his father's wife in that way. But then in 2 Corinthians, I believe he's speaking about that same person. He says, he's repented. Mm -hmm. When I wrote my other epistle, I was crying and I was weeping. But now that he's repented and he's come back into the church, we're not ignorant of Satan's schemes. Right. Reaffirm your love for him. That's the other side of the coin. Yes, we need to rebuke. We need to be uh, more rigid. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily us, but I mean in the body of Christ at large. Uh, we need to be more rigid, especially in the church in America, with sin. All right. And deal with it. Amen. All right. And hate the sin. All right. And rebuke people, not because we're angry with them, but because we love them. We want them set free. And we know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of it because we love the church itself. All right. Remove certain people. Don't even eat with them. It's heavy stuff. Mm. But as I was sitting there, I was thinking, no, no, the Lord has given me a lot of stuff like that in my heart. But that's mostly for the future. It wasn't something for the climate that was here right now. And I said, okay, Lord, so what do you want me to speak on? And I just opened my heart before the Lord, and I was led to turn to Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son. All right. Prodigal, by the way, doesn't mean lost. It means spendthrift. <laughs> but Jesus never called him prodigal. He called him lost. He speaks about the lost sheep in Luke 15, and the lost coin, and then the lost two sons, they were both lost in their own way. And I want to turn to that because I want to give you an encouraging message this morning because I sense that uh, what you're ready to hear and what uh, the Lord wants right now is an uplifting message that isn't contrary to church discipline or being holy, not contrary to the fact that God wants us to pull our lives together and then help one another to pull our lives together according to the rigid standards of the Word of God. You know, if you really receive the true grace of God, the Apostle Peter said, this is the true, true grace of God. Stand firm in it. What's the true grace of God? Well, what he was talking about right there in 1 Peter, living a life that is holy, even when under persecution, responding with love, even to hate. And uh, when you're hated, to respond with love. 
then be sure that no one by any means suffers as a murderer or as an adulterer or as a thief or as an evildoer or even as a self-appointed overseer of other people's affairs. Sometimes we can become meddlers if we come too rigid and legalistic. The true grace of God leads us to live holy. And I am not denying that we should be rigid with one another from time to time. And having said that, now I'm going to go into the message that I believe the Lord is giving us to. We're talking about a young man who was penitent. And that is important. He was penitent. He turned from his sin. He was truly penitent and he turned away from his sin. And God received him. Yes. And uh, the Father received him. Yes. But that's a prerequisite, isn't it? Mm. Turn from your sin. All right. You know, I believe, before I dive into this message, I do want to bring a fence around what I'm saying so nobody misunderstands when I talk about God's love and his forgiveness mm. and how kind he is to us and how loving he is toward us. His love is a holy love. You yeah. know, uh, the Bible says yeah, yeah. in uh, 1 Timothy the conditions for a man to be in leadership. God says to Titus, Titus 1, and Timothy, 1 Timothy 3, I believe it is. He says to Timothy, to Titus, if someone is going to be in a position of leadership, he must be a man of one woman. Married only once, but it can be translated a one woman man. You know, it's not uh, only somebody who sticks to his wife and is faithful to his wife, but he shouldn't be spending a lot of time with another, another woman, even to speak business. He must be a man of one woman, and his wife should be a woman of one man. You know, I'm getting more and more rigid the more I read the Bible and what Jesus said and what the Apostle Paul said about marriage. The exceptions to till death do us part. I mean, I look at it more and more, and I'm not going to go into it right now, but I'm getting more and more rigid when it comes to marriage. I looked up to a man who really ministered to me, and he was a powerful man of God, and he spoke powerful messages that transformed my life. But I had to pull away from him, more or less, because this man divorced and remarried twice. And he was one of the big guns back in the 1970s when it came to preaching the Word of God. Powerfully. But he couldn't really walk the walk. And that's a tough thing. A man in leadership, it's very, very important that he walks the walk. And even in every one of us, yes, yes. to every one of our hearts, in every one of us, there has to be a heart to embrace the whole word of God. And to realize, hey, we just can't be lax. Even when, if we know somebody else is doing something. We're, we might be living right, but if someone else is living in sin, or if they have a relationship that isn't right, or if it doesn't seem to be right, we have to approach them, find out what's wrong, and if there is something wrong, be true to the Word of God, because God is the holy love. He's called us to love, but when I speak about love of the Father, I'm talking about a holy love. Yes, yes. They won't embrace you until you repent and come home and say, I'm willing to do it your way, God. I lay myself before you. I'm yours. And he receives you with open arms. But while I have to say what I've just said, or I'll put it in past tense, what I, I had to say what I had to, what I just said. Thank you. About the harshness of God, or the severity of God, and we have to balance the severity of God with the goodness of God. And understand, we shouldn't give up on anyone. That's right. There is a man who has become very close to my wife and I, not to mention his wife. And this man was rejected by a church I was involved in. They told me not to have anything to do with him. The pastor himself and a co-pastor said, don't have anything to do with him. Turn away from him. Well, this was a brother who kept falling into various sins. But he'd always come back and ask for help. But they finally said, no, no. Uh, our, our, the grace is exhausted. So, in so many words, that's what they said. They said, don't have anything to do with him. We're not going to have anything more to do with you. And he went to a wedding in that church one time, and somebody said, wait out here. And then he had to go inside to get permission to let him in because he was afraid that maybe they didn't even want him to attend this wedding. Well, this was a brother who was always turning from the city, he'd fall, he'd turn, and they said, don't have anything more to do with him. In fact, they even encouraged his wife to live with one of the elders for a time as they just put this guy aside. 
But there was somebody who wouldn't give up on him. Praise God. And uh, through the dealings of God Praise in that brother over many, many years, uh -huh. he realized, hey, well, I've got to reach out to him. Yes. I've got to help him. That's right. right. And that man, whom the Lord had taught something about this prodigal son lesson, is yours truly. Amen. I wouldn't give up on him. Amen. The Lord wouldn't let me. Uh -huh. Sometimes the Lord has led me to turn my back on certain people. This is a man who fell a lot, but he was penitent. And he still had trouble. And I was contacting his wife, and I was praying for him, and I kept on contacting him and contacting him and contacting him. Now he is a leader in a church in New Jersey. Amen. He is doing well. Our, my wife and I have visited him. They know the miraculous power of God. My wife has prayed over his wife. He is a man of God, and because of her willingness to stick with her husband, oh, and because oh. other people wouldn't give up on him, and he found a church that wouldn't give up on him, and they were patient with him, now he's the leader in the church, and he's helping other people. Oh, this is the love of God. The balance is the severity of God with the goodness of God. Amen. Behold the goodness and the severity of God. So we're talking holy love now. We're not talking about love with the you know, that has the cosmic brush. To sweep out all of our sins under the universal rug. No, the blood of Jesus cleanses away sin, deals with it. But if somebody's penitent and he comes to God and says, Lord, I may have my struggles, I may have my difficulties, but Lord, lead me to you. Lead me to people who can help me. I want to be totally yours. God will receive you with open arms. Amen. Glory to God. And don't hang around people who won't do the same with you. Amen. The church has to be the church. Come on. And Christians have to always be Amen. Christians Amen. to one another. Amen. I might go through the entire uh, Luke 15. But Luke 15, it says, Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. Well, in that culture, if you ate with somebody, it wasn't like you know, we do it now. We might eat with just about anybody. But when you eat with someone, that means you're intimate in friendship. It was a very, very deep thing. And Jesus, don't get me wrong, he wouldn't go to a bar like some people have uh, insinuated or said at the reading passages like this. He wouldn't go to the bar and rub elbows with sinners here and there. No, but if they came to him, he would no wise cast them out. All right. Do you know, Jesus said to the Pharisees on one occasion, the tax collectors and the sinners and the harlots will enter the kingdom of God before you. Okay. God doesn't want people who think they're so jolly good and the cat's meow <laughs> that they go to all the church meetings and they dot their I's and they cross their T's but they look down on other people. The other people who are unsaved who seem to have a blameless righteousness according to the law like the uh -huh. Apostle Paul said he had when he had been a Pharisee. But they wouldn't know God if he stared them in the face. And you can tell because they don't have compassion for other people. They'll speak the truth, but they'll do it in love. They'll restore a person entangled with sin, but in a spirit of gentleness, looking to themselves too, lest they too be tempted. And uh, this is the way Jesus was, in the sense that he humbled himself, and he would in no wise cast anyone out. Without respect of persons, I use that term a lot, but it's so important. The church needs to get that. Yes. Without looking at one person above another, seeing everyone as a potential believer, open up your arms to anyone who approaches you. And uh, you want, yeah, I hope I never, ever get too busy to help anyone who's reaching out. So anyway, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. They call him a wine bearer because he talked with the drunkards. Well, why not? Remember the parable he gave? I think it was in Luke 19. There are about how the Pharisee stood before God and said, thank you that I am not as other men. That's the thing. You know, it's good to do good things. He says, I pay tithes of all that I get. I fast twice uh -huh. a week. This is good stuff. But you know that there's something wrong when they think I'm better than. Watch out for that word, T-H-A-N. He says, thank you that I'm not as other men. I do all these things 